Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Welcome. I'm going to close the window because this is kind of loud right outside here. Good morning, good morning. Oh, it's fun to see everybody's like backgrounds. How's it going? Casey and her freaking gorgeous house. Thank you, thank you. Um, it was a wild uh, weekend. Uh, I haven't so seen it. <laughs> ah, yeah. So I put my listing, my personal home up this weekend and it was nuts to say the least. Um, so thank you for your offer, Amanda, with that, but we had 20 <laughs> something offers and we capped it, we stopped uh, offers. Um, you were like very competitive, point? but it was like, I was mm -hmm. amazed. Like it was nuts. So, um, what was it listed for? It was, we were strategic. So the, the thought process was is we wanted to get as many people in the door as possible um it's a wauwatosa ranch so that's really rare and then the aesthetic is quite different um it's very it's like mid-century oh yeah. so cute every bit of it it's so thoughtful it's awesome <laughs> thank you so we put it at um, where the highest comp in the neighborhood was at, uh, sold recently, knowing that that one wasn't quite as like done as ours. Um, we were hoping for some deep pockets, knowing it's not going to appraise. Um, so that was what our goal was. And, you know, we've, we got uh, exactly what we were hoping for. So offers 50 something showing and it was not well congrats Thank you it was very fun to show <laughs> really well, cool hopefully I, i'm gonna start flipping some more here and do some of that mid-century vibe if i can get it um so hopefully we can keep showing some more yeah definitely my buyers were like if we don't get it, can she just do a house for us? And I'm like, I think that might be the plan. <laughs> I don't know how fast this can no, happen. I've but been like, please tell her that she needs to business. keep doing this. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. steal my business one day. I think uh, for the next six months, I'm not going to touch. I bought a fixer upper again. Um, but I'm not going to touch it for six months because I want to get in this gig uh, going. Um, but, you know, thinking about how I can take a little bit, a bite out of the pie, a bigger bite every time. Um, I think that that's an opportunity I might take a look at. Cool. cool. Good, good idea. I think that's worthwhile. Not everybody can pull that off. Very few people can pull that off. <laughs> cool. Well, yes, that was super fun to see and be a part of, even though we didn't, even though we didn't win. I knew, I knew we probably weren't going to, unfortunately. Um, however, we did our best. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of a good lead into what we're going to talk about today. I made like a really vague post about living your best real estate life. Um, the reason for that is we are almost two thirds of the way through the year. We only have one third left. And traditionally that is a third of the year that tends to be pretty quiet. Um, you know, it, how our market tends to go in most cases, we have like a September, October bump of sorts. And um, that is not always the case during an election year, but we don't really know how that's gonna go this year because who knows how anything's gonna go this year. <laughs> you know, COVID hit and now people are having record high years. So like, and that's in, within our organization and then looking at greater Milwaukee. So are there really rules to any of this? When it comes down to it, if you want to make business happen, there's always business to be had, always. Um, so it's good to keep that in mind. You know, we know that we may see a dip in prices or a slow down. We typically see that happen around the holidays. 
Um, so it's good to have that in the back of our minds. It's good to set expectations of our clients for those things to happen. But at the end of the day, that's really no reason to say, ah, well, you know, we're getting towards the holidays. I'm just going to put my feet up and we'll start over next year. Um, there is so much more business to be had the rest of this year. And there's more, you know, improving quality of life, setting big goals, exceeding expectations, laying the groundwork for a successful business to be done. Um, in addition to your continuing education, which is also due by the end of the year, don't forget. So, um, you know, what I keep going back to when I'm looking at, you know, what should we be talking about? What should we be focusing on? Is I keep going back to the MREA or the Millionaire Real Estate Agent. How many of you have that book? I have it. How many of you have looked at it? Does audiobook count? <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. Audio. There's an audio version. I feel like that would be so hard because there's so many charts and stuff. Yeah. So what okay. I decided is but, I was going to listen yeah. to it and then fill it out, go back after the chapter is done and then like review because there's a lot I would recommend buying both if that's yeah. the way you're going to do it because there's a lot of charts you want to fill out and come back to. That's a good idea. So there's a lot in there that I, I haven't fully grabbed on to yet. Um, when I start, so I was in real estate for a little over four years. Uh, Jackie, it's the millionaire real estate agent or the MREA. It's basically our KW, you know, Bible of sorts. Um, so when I start, I was in real estate for a little over four years before I came to Keller Williams. I was with a different brokerage. Um, they had some resources, not nearly the extent to which we do at KW. And so I built my own systems. I built my own habits. Um, I built out my own goals. It was very much kind of my own creation. And so I'm having to undo some things to make them more efficient to tweak things, to kind of think about things in a different way than I have before. So in some ways, I'm learning this with you. Um, and so when I'm referring back to these things, it's, it's me having these aha moments um, with some background in having done business already. But man, are you at an advantage if you can start out this way instead of having to build your own and, you know, reinvent the wheel and then undo and redo um, because these are very proven systems. If anybody is at the point where they feel like they'd want to jump in on mega camp and that wouldn't be too overwhelming. So I'd, you know, just give that caveat that it, it's a lot of info, um, but it is very telling of how many people have found great success just by following what is in this book. And it, it almost feels like cheating to me because I did spend so much time creating my own stuff. But at the end of the day, these are proven systems. You can be creative within those systems and it's all spelled out right there. There's no reason not to. And then our company is built around that. So you have all kinds of support and videos and Facebook groups and what Charlie talks about in our meetings, it all builds out from this book. So I highly recommend if you don't already have it, that you get it. Um, Casey, that's a great idea. Like do the audio because Catherine, I'm way more of an audio book person than I am a reading on paper person. Um, and then have the book for reference because there's some really excellent charts and things in there. Um, and if there's an interest, we can build launch very specific to like a chapter or something in there. Um, the more I'm in there, the more I'm pulling from that and kind of blending it with what I have done or what I've experienced, what I think we should talk about. And so I went back to that today. Um, anytime there's a landmark in the year, that's a time when I'm reflecting and evaluating and just revisiting my goals and how I'm using my time and how I'm building out backwards from goals to um, smaller you know, projects or um, points in the year that I want to measure and then down to my activities on a daily and weekly and monthly basis. So this is a great time to revisit that. Um, if you're brand new, you can do this. If you've been you know, in this for a number of months or even a year or more, this is a really good time to just get back to that. Um, Charlie's gonna send out a registration for Mega Camp, so if you're interested in that. Um, but this is this time of the year, you know, we have 
I think setting a goal based purely on the year, you know, New Year's resolutions, how many people have done that? And it's like, all of a sudden it's August and you're like, oh yeah, what was I going to do? I forgot. Or like, I, you know, made myself feel bad about that for like a month or two. And now I'm <clears> done with that because I just don't want to feel bad. So I'm just going to stop trying. Um, yeah. And it's, it's like this big giant thing and you don't break it down into anything. You're like, I'm going to, you know, lose as much weight or I'm going to sell this much in real estate, but it never gets broken down into anything smaller. It never gets, um, put onto a calendar or a block schedule, or uh, there is very little intentional planning behind it. And so that step is so important and breaking it down to smaller periods of time. So don't think because it's August, this is like, well, 2020 is crap. You know, like this has been a weird year and we only have four months left and I'm just going to coast into winter. I'm going to like try to enjoy summer be outside as much as I can be afraid of being trapped in my house for three months again with COVID and like we'll just figure it out next year so there's something to be said for planning next year like even starting in October but that does not mean that the things that need to happen in 2020 don't keep happening or you don't set a goal or you don't make a plan there's so much more business to be had. There's more clients to connect with. There's more systems to set in place. There's plans to make, you know, give yourself something to look forward to because with everything going on, the thing that's keeping me going is anything to look forward to, right? Like I can't look forward to vacation. I don't have concerts or, um, you know, wine dinners or fun things that I used to do. Now I have to create my own things to look forward to. So it's, it's little things that I'm focusing on. It's realizing that, you know, my why and what's really important is supporting my community. It's being with my family, you know, building the small things in, in, in that regard to keep me going is really important, but also setting those goals for my business, give me something to focus on and something to celebrate and look forward to. And I think that's so important, especially right now, um, rather than being like, oh God, here we go. Election time. I can't get away from these commercials. You know, all this stuff going on in the world. It's hard to figure out where to focus and find positive energy. And so, you know, those little things are important, but also like drive your own destiny, like make a plan, figure out your goal for the rest of the year, for the month, for the week, celebrate those victories and keep pushing forward. So this is a really good time to do that. Um, and if you're looking at the millionaire real estate agent, um, you know, one of the biggest things in there is your mindset and why are you doing this in the first place? And so I think it's good to go back to that, set some time aside this week, give yourself some uninterrupted, completely uninterrupted phone on, you know, airplane mode, uninterrupted thinking time and, you know, give it, give it an hour if you can, or even a half hour or 45 minutes. You'd be amazed how much your mind can open up if you just let it instead of getting distracted. And, you know, wherever you got to lock yourself in your car or whatever to get away and focus and really think about what you want the rest of this year to look like and how do you want to feel and what do you want to have accomplished on December 31st? Lord knows we probably won't be at a big party that night so this is going to be your time to celebrate in, this, in a different way um but it's it's very helpful to picture that as vividly as you can how do i feel what's my family like right now what is my business doing um you know how many clients have i helped how do they feel about my service where do i see my business going all all of those things just stream of conscious take a bunch of notes what, is, what does December 31st look and feel like for you? And give yourself some real time to do this. No judgment, just observation, just get it on paper. Even if it feels silly, even if it feels impossible, mm -hmm. um, even if it's something small, something that you think isn't really that big of a deal worth celebrating, it's, it's what's important to you. So take some time to do that this week. Set aside a block of time. Do not move it. It's an appointment. It is happening. So pick a time when you know you're less likely to be interrupted. For me, that's early morning before I start getting phone calls and texts. Um, but do what works for you. And then from that, take 
those items and build them backwards. So if it's, I have helped this many clients this year. Well, how many, okay, so you have to have helped that many clients. How many have you helped so far? How many do you have left to, you know, help them realize their real estate dreams? And what do you need to do to get to that point? So how many people do you have to have in your pipeline? How many offers do you have to write? How often do you have to go out on showings? You can build that out through your numbers. Um, if it's just as many people as possible, that's not a great measurement. So just pick a big number. Pick something that you know is realistic and then amp it up. It's not about hitting that number. It's about getting as close as possible. It's about growth. It's about doing better than you thought you could. So it's not a failure if you don't hit that number. The, the things that come about with like, how do I feel? Those are a little bit harder to measure, right? That's more of a vision than it is a goal. Um, so if you can break that down to something more specific, you know, I, weight goals are such an obvious, like new year kind of resolution type thing, but like, I want to feel fit and healthy. Okay. Well, what does that look like? Well, I want to, um, you know, track my measurements or track my weight and have this certain number, something you can actually like work towards and then build out your activities from there. Okay. This means I'm going to use these smart goals, so specific and measurable, achievable, things that are realistic um, and that I can, you know, check and measure on a, on a daily and weekly basis and build those into your, your weekly block schedule. And I've talked about this before. So there's other videos that you can go back to, to see how to build out that schedule. But I think it's just a good reminder. If you're like me and like many other agents who are either or been in the business for a while or are just starting out, it is so easy to get caught up in everything going Going on and just feel like you're in the, the tornado of somebody needs a contract, somebody needs a reply call, somebody needs this, somebody needs that. And it's just like every day is a task list. Does anybody feel like that? Where you're just like, okay, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. Like none of it really fully gets you to the next step of what you're really working towards. And the reason that happens is because you fill all the sand in your jar first. I've used this visual before. So if you've heard about the, you know, big rocks first, so you picture a big mason jar, you've got some big rocks, you've got some pebbles, and then you've got sand. If all of that like tasky to do stuff is your sand. So if you put that all in your schedule first, there's no room for the big rocks. And the big rocks are the things that are most important that get you the most, um, get you closer to your goal. That 20% of your activities that gives you 80% of your return those things need to be scheduled first. So make sure you're plotting those out first. Your thinking time, that's a, that's a big rock. Your, you know, those big steps towards your goal or the things that you're doing that relate to your why. Okay, those are your big rocks. If there's not enough, there should be room for the pebbles in the sand after that, but if that sand stuff is making you anxious, then use some leverage. Hire Renee and Julie to do some of your contract to close. There's no shame in that. And I had a really hard time getting over that when I came over. Um, I didn't end up having them do it, but I have an assistant who does. And it took me a while to get over the fact that having help from other people does not mean you're not great at your job. It means you're smart about your strengths, weaknesses, um, how much time is available in a day and what your priorities are. So thinking about things from that perspective, I think is really important too. So give yourself some thinking time to think where you want to be on December 31st. And if, if you're feeling overwhelmed by that, look at just a few main parts of your life. So if you're, um, if you've looked at the one thing, they have like seven different circles in your life. Um, you could just pick a couple from there. So you're trying to build your business. So like, what does your business look like? What does your, um, personal health look like? has been a very challenging year for personal health, both physically and mentally. Um, and what does your family life or your relationships look like? And try to, you know, build like a one big thing from each of those. It doesn't have to be a ton. Once you've got your big list down, like pull a few big rocks from there and make those your focus. We're supposed going to have um, Carrie Oberbrunner in our meeting next week on Tuesday. 
um, for our team meeting with Keller in our office. And he's going to talk more about mental health and how to not have your brain hacked. And this ties right into that. So it's, it's that transition of the season is a perfect time for renewal. So this is a good way to go about that. So take some thinking time to figure those things out. Pick like three big rocks, build them out backwards. If you're having a hard time figuring out how to do that part, text me to set up an accountability call. That's the kind of stuff I'm here for. And then let's get that on your schedule so that you're really truly having something to track, something to follow, a plan, some goals to achieve and celebrate, something to look forward to. It's going to give you tremendous momentum and momentum is the absolute key to success in this business. Momentum is huge. If you're feeling stuck or slow or knocked around, something's going on with your momentum. You've got to readjust. And this is something to pay attention to regularly. So when you lose sight of that, on a you know, certain point in the year, a, a time stamp in the year, we have one third of the year left. At the end of this month, we have one third of the year left. You have time to do some amazing things. So this is a great opportunity to do that. Yeah. Um, so I'll be touching more on some more specific <clears throat> things in the MREA. Um, if there's demand for it, I'll, we'll take the book and we'll go chapter by chapter. We can do that every week if that's if there's an interest there. So let me know if that is of interest to you. We'll, I'll see if Mandy can send out a survey um, if we want to build off of that or if we just want to do some more specific things based on questions you have. Um, but this is, you know, this is your time to have the things you're looking for addressed. But I think it's just very helpful to have that reminder. And if for you that means like, I think I'm going to join a team. I'm just not, it's not clicking. Okay, well, what do you have to do to get to that point? How do you find out about teams in the office? How do you figure out what you need and do they have that to offer you? How do you figure out how that affects your financial goals? You know, there's so many different ways you can go about this, but I think it's really important to find some specific things that you can measure, work towards, build out, um, so that come the end of the year, you can look back and say, I was very intentional and purposeful. I had goals. I built them out. I had activities that worked towards them. Um, maybe some of them didn't work out. Maybe I changed it midway through this last third of the year. Maybe after the first month, I was like, oh, that's not working. Or that's already done. Add something else. Um, but it's, it's always about growth and working towards something bigger. And that's not just in your business. That's in your life. You know, KW is about living a big life. So it's about having that counterbalance doing things that have a positive impact on your life outside of work, but also on your business and your clients. So I highly encourage you to plan that exercise this week. Thinking time is major. It feels, for me, it feels kind of selfish and self-indulgent because I think it's fun to plan and make notes and all that stuff. I know it's not everybody's favorite thing, um, but at the end of the day, it's really, really pivotal. And it's how you it's how CEOs behave. It is how, how people who run big businesses behave. That's a habit of highly successful people. So this is not a hobby. This is your business. And you are treating it like a CEO from the start. That's only going to continue to help you drive your business in a, in a thoughtful and purposeful direction. Sound good? Is everybody going to do it? I'm doing it this week. I got to reset. Good to be aware of that stuff. Cool. So um, I try to keep this so that the second half of our time together is for questions, um, scenarios, kind of talking through things that you are working on right now. So it can be related to setting those goals, those big rocks, plotting out your black schedule. It could be other things you've had come up this week. Um, so I, I give the floor to you if anybody has something that's come up that you want to chat about. I have something if nobody else does. Okay. <laughs> um, so last night I have a client, I, I listed and sold their duplex. Um, and last night the wife FaceTime me like, so there's a restaurant that we want to buy. So this is the address. Can you just check into it for us? Um, 
so obviously it's a, a lead and all that kind of stuff, but it's a commercial situation, which I am not have any experience in, don't know anything about it. So I, you know, reached out on Facebook and I've been getting a lot of um, comments and advice and, re, you know, things that I should check into and do. Um, and so learning that, you know, residential and commercial are obviously very different, especially if it's like a restaurant where there's going to be a lot of um, the equipment, you know, um, it's like a turnkey type situation, tables, chairs, everything is likely going to be left there. So there should be a bill of sale as well. So I, I have a message out to um, a North Shore agent, Dan Mickelson, who is, I guess, done has experience in that and I'm going to kind of be referring slash partnering up with him on this hopefully so that I can keep this client wanting to reach out to me even though this is not something that I can really handle. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I've been in that position. It's 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 a tricky one to be in because you're right. You want to keep that relationship going. You want to stay involved but it's really a whole different animal and to best serve them. It is definitely in their best interest to have somebody who knows commercial. It is so different the way agents interact, um, the, the process, the timelines, there's so much about it. That's very different. Um, I've done some commercial before. It was not my favorite thing. Um, and I've done it for clients who are friends, but, um, I, I have done it in the past in conjunction with a commercial agent. Um, and I've also just handed something off to a commercial agent. Um, the challenge with being, with trying to do it yourself is that there's a lot of legality there. And um, it's definitely not to your client's best advantage to have somebody in a situation who doesn't really know how this stuff goes. Um, there are of course resources out there, but Dan's a great person to talk to. Okay, good. Cause I don't definitely know give him. you some good insight. Um, it yeah. may be worthwhile. Yeah. He's, he's been helpful to me as well in some of these scenarios. Um, and is, ultimately, is he on the I Jay think, Schmidt team? you know, it's I'm not sure. I don't know. I think he was, I don't know if he still is or not, Okay, but he was right. when I'll I first talked to him. I was over, I was like two years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just think it's, it's very challenging to try to take that on yourself, though I completely understand the desire to hang on to that client. I think ultimately, if you can say like, this is your commercial guy and I'm your residential person and um, I'm gonna be checking in and making sure things are going smoothly. Um, but I will guess, talk to Dan first, but I'm guessing that he's not um, gonna be real gung-ho about like you being a, a person that's implementing the process because oh, I that don't can be. get more confusing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd rather just sit back and learn so, and just kind you know, of observe the yeah. process. Checking in, asking questions. Yeah. Making sure that the client is okay. Um, yeah. I mean, you have to be kind of careful with like confidentiality and how involved you are if he's really their go-to. Um, right. And in terms of like giving advice and stuff like that. Uh, but if you're like, I'm just here to observe, I want to make sure you're taken care of. If anything comes up and they come to you, be prepared to bring that to Dan. Um, but yeah, it's, it is a whole different animal to navigate and <clears throat> it can get a little, it can get hairy if you don't know, like the first commercial deal I did, I was on one side and another residential agent was on the other side who swore she knew what she was doing. And I, I, I ended up carrying the load and that was through lots of leaning on other people and it was kind of messy and I, I, it was not the kind of service I wanted to offer my clients. And yeah. so it's, I would not do that again. Yeah. My yeah. goal is to like keep this yeah. very clean because and streamlined when it comes and not on, sour. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing at the end of the day, is it, is it worth trying to get one more sale or is the ultimate goal to offer excellent service and a great experience and still be seen as a resource to your clients because they're, you know, like, like I said, if you're like, look, I want to be your person for everything, but it's more important that you have a great experience. And, you know, Dan's your commercial expert. I'm your residential expert. If you need anything in that regard, I'm here for you. I'm going to connect you with him. 
I'm going to make sure that that's going well and that's a good fit. If it's not, I'll find you someone else. Um, you know, I'm here to be your go-to, but ultimately it's about you having a great experience. And that can be right. true too. If any of you have people looking in like crazy locations that you know nothing about, um, especially if it's a listing, you know, if you're like, man, I really want that business, but I have no idea what the market's like in Wales. And I have somebody who wants to list a house in Wales. Is there a better way you could serve them? You know, could you team up with an agent in that situation? Um, you know, ultimately, if it, if it is obvious to your client that your top priority is to take care of them and not to make money off of them, that will show. So the more you can come from that place of abundance and of service, it's going to come back around to you, um, you know, as much as you can be of help. But, you know, also make sure if you are referring somebody out to another agent, do your due diligence and make sure that that agent really is highly qualified, that you've had a chance to talk to them, that you think they're going to be a good fit in terms of personality, you know, do that work on the front end um, to make sure that you're not just like tossing them to somebody because they will feel that. Um, you know, make it a warm introduction, but there are, there are going to be times that there are things outside of your um, knowledge base or your area or whatever it is. And that's a time to, to kind of look at it and say, is this an opportunity for growth for me to learn something and serve these people well, or is this like a practicing on my clients thing and I'm not going to do that? And I have another great resource available. And I think, Bethany, your instinct to go to the Facebook group was great. There's always people out there who can kind of give you their thoughts or suggest who might be a good resource. We have an unbelievable network of agents to go to for everything. Um, so definitely take advantage of that. That's great. Yeah. yeah anybody else have, to have that? Yeah. Was that Alex? Yeah, sorry. Can you talk about referral fees in that kind of situation? Um, so with referral fees, I think what's fairly standard within the company, like if you have somebody referring somebody from another state or vice versa, 25% um, to the referring agent is pretty common. I've seen up to 35%. Um, if it's something like you're new and you're, you're happy to get the experience and someone's going to walk you through it and that sort of thing, it might be more like 50%. Um, you know, if you're within a team, that's pretty common, 50 or 60, 40 or 40, 60, depending on who brings the lead. Um, but if it's like outgoing to somebody, 25% is fairly common, um, but it varies. And, and it's worth clarifying that early on. Hey, you just want to check is like is this cool for a referral fee. And then make sure you fill out the referral form right away <laughs> so that it's taken care of immediately and everybody's signed off on it. So that you don't get to closing and you're like, oh crap, I didn't fill out that form. I got nothing. So just cross your T's and dot your I's. Make sure. So then if you have that referral, you just download the referral fee from the zip forms and then you would send that to the agent that you're referring to. Yeah. And there's a, there, there's a good amount that you would fill out yourself and sign. And I would check with Dan because with commercial maybe a little different yeah. depending on the price point. That's the other thing, price point. Yeah. It may have right. something to do with it. Yeah. 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 And then determine, you know, if that's worthwhile to you, how that's going to best serve them, et cetera. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. You're welcome. I have a question. How's everybody else doing? Yeah. Um, so I have a listing coming up. And I am terrible at descriptions. Like I fostered dogs for years and years and years. And I would have to like copy and paste old bios to send over because help. <laughs> because it was only on MLS once. That's a good question. <laughs> Is there any videos or resources? So um, I went to a class once at a national conference about this because I, I really Joy writing and I find marketing fascinating. Um, you know, things I highly recommend keeping in mind that I think are common, common things that are just kind of weird. Number one, which is obvious to everybody, but don't do it. Don't put it in all caps. 
that's weird. It's like you're being yelled at. I know at some point that was like the clearest and easiest way to read things and people still do that. Don't do that. Number two, keep in mind that real estate descriptions are not always complete sentences, but do your best to sound intelligible. <laughs> These like tons of like HWF for hardwood floor and blah, blah, blah. Like at the end of the day, this is no longer only going to real estate agents. This is going direct to consumer. So if people don't know what the heck HWF is, it doesn't matter that it's in there. So think about the fact that people looking to purchase a home are going to read these and it's not just agents. Also, our average attention span right now is like a goldfish. So don't write a gigantic novel about this house with the most important stuff at the bottom. You know, think about it from a buyer's perspective. I'm looking at a listing. What's the first thing I do? I look at the pictures, right? So the pictures are telling me a story. Don't put in the description exactly what's in the pictures, right? Like it's there, it's in the pictures. If you have more than, I can't remember the number. If you have more than 15 photos, put your most important one in the first 15 because some of these um, sites only grab that many. They won't see all the other pictures. So keep that in mind too in your description. Um, general outline I like to follow is attention grabber. So what do people want most in homes? So this is the place to put something like um, open concept, fully updated, new this, new that, white kitchen, you know, that kind of stuff should be in the first couple of sentences. The very first sentence should be something that grabs you. It should be an exclamation. You have to see this house or mid-century lover's dream, that kind of thing. And then the middle should have um, some highlights or things that you might not be able to find in other places. So like roof this year, furnace this year, some like <clears throat> general stat kind of stuff. And you could get floral in there to some extent, you know, painting a picture, um, but keep it to the point. So, you know, enjoy, you know, beautiful backyard patio, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, think about what's a hot button issue right now. Perfect home office loft, that kind of thing. Um, keep in mind fair housing. You cannot touch things that are protected classes of citizens. So that includes age. Um, I would, I would not include his and her closet, that kind of thing. Sometimes it's a his and a his, sometimes it's a her and a her, sometimes it's just a her. Don't exclude people in your description. So find other ways to word that. Um, even things like, like walkable are technically um, against people who can't walk. People who are of different abilities are protected class of citizens. So things like nearby or convenient, find other words that are gonna be more inclusive and not get you in trouble for fair housing violations. Um, and once you've written it, go back and take stuff out because it's going to be too long. Um, the last, the last sentence should be a call to action. So, you know, this won't last long or make your, you know, schedule your showing today or, um, you know, make this backyard oasis yours or something like that. Are we so supposed it kind of has a outline to it. Yeah. Are we supposed to be getting away from saying like master bedroom? I heard it's supposed to be it's, like main bedroom or yeah. something like that. Yeah. A lot of people saying primary, um, not a bad idea. I mean, if you think it's going to be confusing to your audience, you know, choose how you want to do that. There's definitely some reason for sure. Um, and I would also say, just make sure that whatever you're putting into your listing in MLS, all those details, make sure they're complete and accurate and that they're checked by the seller. So once you've got everything filled out and you have your, your listing link, um, first thing, send it to them and ask them to review it. Not just the public view, but the agent view as well. Just clarify if you send them the agent view. Don't share this, please. This is for agents only, but I just want you to look at this. Um, if there's some stuff in there that's more technical, that's more agent focused, put it in the, the private notes. You know, room size is estimated. Uh, basement 
repairs were made X date, we have a warranty. That kind of stuff scares buyers. You know, you want to be forthright, but it may need to be translated through an agent. So you don't have to put everything in that description. I've seen some really smart ones that really grab people's attention where they sound more like an advertisement because it is, right? You don't have to use the same language. Everybody, gleaming hardwood floors and big windows. It's like all the same, the same, the same, the same. If you want to get creative, really get to the heart of it. I saw a great ad in this class that was for a really small house. And it was like, simplify your life. You know, get rid of all the junk focus on what's important, super efficient. It was just, it was like, it was really appealing and attractive. It made me want to live, you know, tiny house life. So if you're feeling stuck, don't look at other listings, look at advertisements, look at descriptions of cars and advertisements, look at descriptions of vacations, look at, um, you know, things that are grabbing people for other kinds of products and try to pull from that. Because everybody writes the same crap, like do something a little bit different or paint a picture or just get right to the point. You know, you can go about it in a few different ways um, and it may be different for each house. Think about your audience, you know, a condo that's $150,000 downtown versus a giant house in Muskego is going to have a different audience. So how do I appeal to them? Awesome. Thank you so much. To help? Sure. <laughs> Anybody else? What are you guys working on? How's business? How are your clients? Are they all on edge? I'm about ready to kill somebody. Not really, but it's been stressful. <laughs> no, I think people going are waiting smooth. to figure out what's happening with this election and stuff. They're all just kind of they take a step forward and then two steps back and they kick the tires and I don't know. Yeah, I've had, I've had some people that are slower to decide. Um, I think the, a change in weather sometimes will push people one way or the other. Um, you can do some friendly coercion as well. If you know what their goal is and they just need a little push like they would from a friend who knows what's best for them. Um, this is a good time to do that if you've got a bunch of people just kind of floating. Um, I have a, a kind of an issue. So I have personal friends so in my sphere who want and are exciting to start looking. So I sent them to a couple of different mortgage places to be able to figure out, get their pre-approval. They had one from a year ago, um, but to get it updated and what have you, so we talked about monthly um, budget, knowing that they're looking for a condo and that association fee will probably dictate that quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. What they're giving me for their monthly allowance is not matching up now with the um, mortgage um, pre-approval. They haven't gotten a formal pre-approval, but they're pushing me to see places that I don't think that they can afford. How do I delicately balance that, especially knowing they are close friends too, and it gets a little sticky when you're talking about financing and someone who's personally uh, really, or close to you. Yeah, that's a good question, Casey. So um, a couple of things that the market right now is doing that actually will really well for explaining that in a very clear, um, non-judgmental way. Number one, every seller expects a pre-approval with an offer. So you, if you see a place and you love it, when you write an offer, you're going to need a pre-approval. So we're going to have to have that on hand. Um, number two, we're going to have to have it before we go out and look at the place because with the speed of the market, with the days on market that are happening right now, you pretty much have to decide when you're in the property if you're writing an offer or not. And that is not the time to scramble to get a pre-approval. And from a friend or the guidance of a great buyer's agent perspective, I usually will say, I am looking out for your stress levels and your heart. And 
number one, if we find a great place and don't have a pre-approval, it's going to be a, a mad dash to get it ready to write an offer. And you may find in that process that it's not in your budget or we might not be able to get it in time. And that would be heartbreaking. And number two, if we look at places that are not within the reasonable budget, you're gonna fall in love with something that is unattainable at this point in time and nothing else will compare. And that's the worst. It's the worst to see something you can't have and then have to like settle for something else. And so I'm looking out for you and your best interests to like achieve your ideal scenario, which includes working within your budget and also so giving you the opportunity to get your offer accepted, knowing that most homes are priced under market value. Now, granted, with condos, depending on where what market you're in, that's less true. Condos are tending to be priced closer to market value, but there's going to be competition. So it's really, I'm setting you up for your, you know, I'm best setting you up for success. We're working together as a team, and here's the things you need to consider. So there, it's no judgment of like, you can afford that, you can't afford that. It's like, our goal is to get your offer accepted and get you in a great situation that works with your budget. So here's what we need to keep in mind. We are in our best position with a pre-approval in hand. And here's the reasons why. And if they're like, well, we just want to know, you know, if you're like, I can show you a building, if you want to get a feel for a building, um, you know, we can look at lower price stuff. And if we look at higher price stuff, I'm just warning you. It could ruin your perspective. I'm more than willing to help you however I can. Let's see if we can speed up the pre-approval. Um, you know, I'm happy to get you out there. But if we do this, understand this is a risk. At yeah, what point did pre-approvals become like the thing? I got two people talking at once. What was Sorry. that, Alex? At, at what point did pre-approvals become commonplace? I mean, can we tell buyers in the last X years, this has become a thing, whereas if you were in the market like five years ago, you never saw it? Um, it's been, for a while, that's been a requirement. I mean, over five years, probably 10 10 or so. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you're dealing with like parents or siblings who are like, well, when I bought a house, I don't know. Well, yeah. the market changes all the time. My, my job is to help you understand what the market's doing right now and how we can best approach it to achieve your goals. Here's what the market's doing. This is not my interpretation. This is what's happening. Here's some numbers. You know, use that as fact. Mm -hmm. Or speak from your own experience, Casey. You know, I had a bajillion offers to look at. If something didn't have all the pieces necessary, it was out. We don't have time to back and forth about little things like that. We need a complete, well-written offer with all the paperwork, including pre-approval. Yeah, and if they're still pushing, I mean, you could, you could take them out, but it, with the caveat, it's at all of our own risks. This could go, this could go ugly. <laughs> Typically, if they understand, like, I'm doing this for them, it's not me saying, I don't want to waste my time. It's not me saying, um, you know, I don't really have time for you to do this. It's me saying like, I want you to achieve your goals. I'm looking out for your best interest. Here's what's happening. Okay, if the issue is getting your pre-approval, how do we make that happen faster? And then we can get you out there. It shouldn't take that long to get a pre-approval, especially if they have a previous one. Even if it means you have to switch lenders. Yeah, like within a few days, within a week for sure. Yeah, so, and sometimes that's a good way to kind of push them because the like the lending part is not fun, right? Like that's not fun. That's boring. It's numbers. You have to like look at your budget and stuff. Most people don't love that. They just want to look at houses and pictures. So if you can say like, okay, let's schedule a time to look at homes on Saturday. You have this week to get your pre-approval. You know. You're going to call them today. You're going to fill up on that online application today. Let's find out how long it takes them to get it to you. Let's work together to make this happen so that we're ready by Saturday. Then they have something to look forward to, and they're not like, well, I'm just going to go to an open house then. Yeah, it's tricky. And you'll get people like that all the time. And ultimately, you're just looking out for them. 
And the market kind of works to the advantage of saying like, there's no time to look at a house and then scramble. Who wants to do that? So can you maybe a, a strategy for, you know, maybe it's the first time home buyers or people that are slow to be getting their act together with this pre-approval. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it's like you want to like maybe dangle the carrot and be like, okay, let's see a few houses, you know, just to kind of get, get the ball rolling a little bit um, mm -hmm. so that they see like, oh, I better get my act together to get my pre-approval. So when we do see a house, we can actually do something about it. Otherwise they're just kind of hanging back there and they're procrastinating this whole getting pre-approved. Yeah. And you do sometimes have to do that. I would say if you do, um, it would be worth the exercise of pulling out a mortgage calculator and saying, okay, what do you think you want to spend? Okay, let's keep in mind that whatever we're looking at, especially for houses, is going to be under this price because we need to leave wiggle room for an aggressive offer. Um, let's look at an example house and pull the taxes. Um, let's consider either, like for Casey, the condo fees. Um, also, think about private mortgage insurance, and that can easily add 100 to $200 to a payment per month. That's pretty significant. Um, and then insurance and utilities, you know, kind of keeping all that in mind and build that out with them. Um, and if you're like, okay, does this match what you're going for? Does this work within your budget? Is this doable? Actually walking them through that exercise because a lot of people don't want to like get out the mortgage calculator and like, oh, this will be fun, you know? So if you can walk them through it um, and say, this is not 100% accurate. We need to run this by your lender to see if this matches up. But if they can't make that step to like do it with their lender themselves, that could be a thing you could do and say like, okay, if this looks comfortable and we're leaving a good amount of space between asking price and what your max is on this house, then okay, let's go out and see a couple of places um, as a carrot. But I pulled out the calculator, but the problem I'm running into is expectations and wants. Mm -hmm. um, and then them forgetting about some of the debt that they might have um, and not um, putting that into their budget. So mm -hmm. we were all set to go, and I said, okay, just renew your pre-approval. We should be good. And it's not that they purposely thought, like, misled me in thinking what they could afford. It's they simply forget about a lot of the expenses. So while we did all those steps, that's where all of a sudden everything's coming to a screeching halt because they can't um, afford the, the scheduled showings we've got. So it's mm -hmm. just a pain right now. Yeah, I mean, ultimately you're, you don't want them to end up in a position where they can't afford what they're in. Um, and at the end of the day, the lender has the golden ticket, right? Like if the underwriter says you can't, this won't work. I don't care what you think your budget is. This, we will not approve this. You can't have the money from us to buy this place. That's the end. So, and that's heartbreaking. You do not want to get in a position where they like somehow finagle a pre-approval, get an accepted offer, and then get to their loan commitment and it falls apart. That's devastating. So, you know, coming from... The perspective of I'm looking out for your best interests. I want you to get into a great situation. You know, we want to get out there. If you want to get out there and see places, we just have to understand that this might be out of your reach. This might be next place, you know. So keeping that realistic perspective and knowing like you're not going to find a bargain in this market. This is not the market for writing under asking price. Unless something's been out there for weeks, and there's something wrong, it's overpriced. It's very rare you're gonna see that. Pretty much everything's selling at or above asking price and we need to be prepared for that. Yeah, and if it helps like with people who don't have a pre-approval yet, you've got your you know, lenders that you think do a great job for your clients, send them a link to the online application. Send, you know, get them on a phone call with the lender. Get them on a text chain with the lender take that first step for them because that's the hardest part you know offer to reach out to the lender and say hey so we're talking about renewing their pre-approval they want to work with you again could you give them a call they want to help too and it, sometimes it's just hard when you're the person who's going to purchase 
to just make that call or just get on that website or take the time to find the link. So even just doing that one little step can help like get them going. Yeah, I often rely on my lenders to kind of take that initiative. Hey, I know they haven't reached out to you yet or they started the application process or where are they at this point? I know you can't tell me all their financial stuff, that's confidential, but like, where are we with the process? You know, we're going to go out and look at places this week for this price. Is that matching up with what you're seeing? When do we, when can we expect a pre-approval? That way you're not like, oh my God, we're at the house. I don't know what's going on with their loan. Can we make this happen? I can't say. Well, it depends. I don't know. We'll have to see what the lender says. I don't know. You know, take that next step and reach out to the lender directly and try to make a plan. All right. Well, we're getting close to 11.30 here. Are there any last minute quick questions, concerns, activities that are working, victories, things to celebrate, stuff to look forward to? I have two closings that should be happening. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Yeah. On a, yeah, on my VA loan, I'm still waiting to hear about when that VA loan approved our VA appraiser is going to be coming out, but luckily we don't have the closing set till September 30th. <laughs> oh, great. You're good. I hope so. <laughs> you should be good. So I, yeah, I worked. Yeah, we, that appraisal the list, is really nerve wracking, but. It is. And um, we worked a lot very closely with the listing agent and the homeowner to do a few things like to add a hand railing to the upstairs, um, things that we knew would be red flag because we want it to be a clean appraisal so he doesn't have to come back. Mm -hmm. So you were proactive, Bethany? You're very proactive. Yes. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Good. Good. That saves you so much time. That revisit also costs your clients. So if you have an appraisal for VA or FHA, and you know something's going to come up. Yes, good call. Be proactive. Figure out what's probably going to come up and see if you can navigate that or uh, negotiate that into your inspection contingency or just talking to the agent and the, um, and the seller about doing that stuff proactively. Because if the appraiser has to come out for a second visit to make sure work is done that they flag in the first visit, they usually will charge your, your client, your buyer. Uh, yeah, and this actually, this was... Uh, everything out. This was an as is kind of a sale. Um, and, but luckily the, you know, the seller obviously wants to sell. It's a rural type home. And uh, just, just talking between me, this and the um, listing agent, they said, oh, we'll do a few things, you know, just, we're just, we'll just do them just to make sure this, this praise is out. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. Good. That's fabulous. Wonderful. Okay, well, you've got um, the rest of this week and up until next Tuesday to set up that thinking time and set up a few of your big rocks and, and things you want to achieve by the end of the year. So I'm going to be checking back and seeing how that went. I'm going to be asking you about it next week. You will be held accountable. You could even set up a call with me if you want to get into specifics on that. Um, so don't forget to use that as a resource. And um, we've got a whole third of the year left and a lot of awesome things that can happen. You know, we're seeing people have their best, I'm having my best year ever. This month is gonna be my best month ever. I will close more this month than I did in my entire year and almost my entire second year. Um, it's, there is to be had. And the only way that's happening is if you're setting goals and breaking it down. I'm not getting here by accident. This isn't like, I don't even know. This is like flying at me, business is happening. Like I have intentional goals. I follow activities to get me to that point. I've put things in place to try to take as best care of my clients as possible so they come back. Um, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I have a lot of growth to go. I've got a lot of things to figure out, but I'm, I'm sticking with my goals. I'm sticking with my systems. I'm coming back to my purpose, my why, what I'm trying to offer my clients. Um, and that drives everything I do. And sometimes I forget my big rocks. I have to dump everything out and start over. Put the big rocks in first. Don't fill it all up with sand first. 
Um, but it's, it's constantly evolving. You're constantly growing and changing. There's, there's always something to adjust, you know, try it out for a bit. See how it feels. You're never stuck. That's the cool thing about running your own business. It's all up to you. So, um, try not to get overwhelmed and just focus on a few important things. You know, one thing at a time, the one thing book is another great resource we could go to, um, and keep plugging along because it's, you can see in the numbers, if you're in our meetings on Tuesdays with Charlie, business is still there. There are some drops in market, but our office, our agents, and the resources we have available to us are making us extremely productive. So you're in an ex excellent position to be on that boat too. Cool. Have a great week. and Enjoy the beautiful weather. And I'll check back with you guys next Tuesday. Don't forget to text me if you want an accountability call. Thank you. You're welcome.